a star, a role model, an independent spirit, Katherine Hepburn. Her name is the embodiment of style, a zest for life, and a woman who was so much more than the part she played. Today, On the Block takes you to Sotheby's New York for a very special preview of their June 2004 Katherine Hepburn estate sale, including some of the most cherished items from her estate. From personal papers to meaningful mementos, exotic furnishings, to her signature style. Today, property from the estate of an American icon, Katherine Hepburn, goes on the block. Catherine Hepburn led a life on her own terms. In the 1930s, she was the prototype for the 21st century woman. She went to Hollywood on her own terms, she negotiated her contracts on her own terms, and she even was quoted at one time that she led her life like a man. And the reason being was the family behind her. Her father was a physician out of Hartford, Connecticut, who specialized in venereal disease. Her mother was a suffragette who helped found Planned Parenthood with Margaret Sanger. This is the family, this unconventional family in a very conservative town that she grew up with in her childhood. And they told her when she was young that she could do anything that she wanted to do. And she kept that anchor behind her all her life. And because of that, Women look up to her because she was independent. When she wanted to marry, she married. When she didn't want to marry, she didn't marry. She went out with who she wanted to go out with. She traveled where she wanted to go. She acted when she wanted to. She painted when she wanted to. She did it all on her own terms, and she excelled at that. And you look at 2004, and everything that she did over the last 70 years is still as relevant and fresh today as it was 70 years ago. Today we're going to be looking at a wide variety of property from the estate of Catherine Hepburn. Now all told there are 694 lots, but unfortunately we don't get to see all of them today. But we're going to see about 30 or 40, and they're going to be from different parts of her life. We're going to take a view of her biography, her history, some relics from stage and screen, some mementos from her romances with Howard Hughes and Spencer Tracy, some souvenirs from her travels, and then a few pieces of furniture and decoration from her homes, as well, of course, the big secret of Katherine Hepburn that many people didn't know for years is that she was an artist, and we're going to take a look at some of her artwork. Catherine Hepburn was a born and bred New Englander, brought up in Hartford, Connecticut. She had a very happy childhood. She was a great sportswoman. The family was very athletic. They played everything from golf to tennis to swimming at the beach. And in fact, they had a house called Fenwick in Old Saybrook, Connecticut. And after high school, she went to Bryn Mawr following in the steps of her mother, who attended Bryn Mawr in the early 1900s. And at that time, she was going to major in medicine, but she changed over when she decided she wanted to become the world's greatest actress. <laughs> Lot number two is a childhood photograph and a lock of her baby hair. And I find it interesting, there was obviously a lot of love in the Hepburn family because they documented her, her birth with a telegram and then, and then pulled this lock of baby hair and it's actually signed over to a friend of theirs, Mary Tao, who lived in New York City. And as we noted, this is the only piece we're selling in the sale, but they had several of them for both her and her brothers and sisters throughout her childhood. 
Locks of hair have been saved by families for generations and generations, and many times children's hair would be put in lockets and worn as adults. Um, we're talking as far back as the 1700s. And there's an entire group of collectors that collects nothing but locks of hair. Some go after locks of hair of historical figures like George Washington or Abraham Lincoln, and others will go after Marilyn Monroe or Elvis. We don't do DNA tests, but the, the key to any of it is being able to prove the authenticity of it or the provenance. And of course, coming from the estate and having the card with it, of course we know this is her hair. There's absolutely no doubt. Lot 11, we're offering, and I find this amazing that she saved them, a lot of her class papers and notes from Bryn Mawr. And I believe these are from her freshman year because these are basically calculus papers and math papers, which is at the time she was looking to study medicine. And then of course she changed over to studying acting. Again, I find it amazing she actually saved these for all these years and we have them in front of us. And it appeared that she was a pretty good student. Class papers from Bryn Mawr are going to appeal to basically two types of collectors, one a little more narrow than the other. It's going to appeal to someone who likes to have handwritten materials from an entertainer, which oftentimes also goes into the same category as canceled checks, driver's licenses, passports. But then you're also going to have people that approach it from a scholarly point of view. I would assume that alumni from Bryn Mawr would be very, very interested because she's the most famous alumnus from Bryn Mawr College. In our first session, lot number 14, is Katherine Hepburn's wedding dress. Now, first of all, many people don't even know that Katherine Hepburn was ever married. The person that they most associate with her romantically, of course, is Spencer Tracy, with whom she had a 27-year love affair. But when Katherine Hepburn was at Bryn Mawr, she met Ludlow Ogden Smith her junior year. And they started a courtship which culminated in their getting married December 12, 1928. She was 21 years old and we have the dress that she was married in. Now, oddly enough, she talks about it in me, in her autobiography, but for the life of us, and we've gone through the entire estate archive, we cannot find a photo of Miss Hepburn and, and Ludlow Ogden Smith together on her wedding day. But this occasion had to be important to her because she spends a half a page just describing the dress, which she kept all her life. And the dress is fabulous. It's like no wedding dress you've ever seen. And I'm guessing that she actually bought it when she went to Paris the, the year before with her friend Alice Palache. Because to Baban, it's a French designer, it's couture, but it actually looks sort of like an ethnic flapper dress. It's ivory crushed velvet. It's heavy brown embroidery on the, on the collar and on the sleeves and it's really quite spectacular. But it's not like any wedding dress I've ever seen, but of course, Katherine Hepburn's not like any other person I've ever known either. So, amazing dress. Next up, we have lots 32, 34, and 35. Three different Louis Vuitton suitcases. And if you look closely, you can see the KHH monogram on each one of them. Now, of course, Katherine Hepburn, being an actress, was on the road. She took to the high seas, she took to the air, everywhere where she could ply her craft. And she learned early on from her good friend, Laura Harding, that it was essential to have a great set of luggage. And what could be better than Louis Vuitton? And of course, Louis Vuitton this year is celebrating their 150th anniversary. Well, these date back from probably, we're looking at the 30s and 40s. And she used them, as you can see, year after year after year, whether she was on a uh, steamship, on an airplane, or traveling by car. They're well-traveled. They are well-traveled suitcases. Miss Hepburn really enjoyed buying great things and using them. She did not believe in putting things in a drawer or, or in a closet. She used what she had. Oftentimes, people look at condition 
and if there's wear and tear, they look at it as a negative. However, a lot of times, particularly in celebrity-based auctions, wear is a great thing because it also adds to authenticity and provenance. And again, it shows that something was very close to that person. Coming up, when Katherine Hepburn's career was down, she wouldn't let herself be counted out. At one of the lowest points, if not the lowest point, of Katherine Hepburn's career, she took her greatest risk. Katherine Hepburn actually got her big break on the stage. She got a starring role for a Broadway play called The Warrior's Husband and came to the attention of agent Leland Hayward, who sent a tape of her to Hollywood. And the next thing you know, they signed her up to play opposite John Barrymore in the 1932 movie A Bill of Divorcement. She stayed at RKO the next few years, and two years later, she won her first Oscar for a starring role in Morning Glory. She continued to work with RKO, starring as Joe in Little Women. Uh, Christopher Strong, Alice Adams, Sylvia Scarlet, and continued there until she decided to do a, a play on Broadway called The Lake, which was her undoing in the late 30s. It proved to be a bust so much that she decided to buy herself out of her contract. And just when she was probably at her lowest period in the late 30s, she was approached by Philip Barry, who was a great playwright, and he happened to have written a play for her, and it was called Philadelphia Story. Well, at the time she was seeing Howard Hughes, who just happened to be a billionaire aviator, and he helped her negotiate the rights to Philadelphia's story, the film rights. The play was a huge smash. She starred in the film version, and that jump-starred her career, and she never looked back after that. One of the reasons why the American Film Institute named her the number one actress of the 20th century, I think, is obvious, in that she probably has had more range than any other film actress as well as great stage presence. I mean here's someone who was able to play absolute screwball comedy in Pat and Mike, Death Set, Philadelphia Story, costume drama in Mary Queen of Scotland, in Lion in Winter. She could take on social issues and guess who's coming to dinner and she could even play the romantic part in something like Summertime or The Adventurous in African Queen. It didn't matter what the role was, she could play it. Old or young, feeble, but mostly, she enjoyed playing strong, independent women with something to say. And for that, I think she'll always be remembered. First up, we have Lot 25, which is Katherine Hepburn's very first film contract from 1932 which was negotiated for her by Leland Hayward. He's the one who brought her out to Hollywood and had her meet with David O. Selznick from RKO, and they needed someone to star opposite John Barrymore in Bill of Divorcement. And they loved the way she looked, they loved the way she sounded, and signed her right on the spot. This is a really important document because it is the very first contract she ever signed for film. We equate it very much like in baseball to a player's rookie contract or even their rookie baseball card. This is the beginning, this is the start, it's unpredictable, no one knows where a person's career is going to go. And to have that first document in your hand is an amazing artifact of a person's career. In Lot 31, we have fabulous portraits of Katherine Hepburn by RKO studio photographer Ernest Backrack. And everyone knows that Miss Hepburn had fabulous style, beauty inside and out, but I think these portraits even capture her in a far more glamorous light than I think what we're even used to. That rare intersection of beauty and youth, a little bit of experience, a little bit of sassiness and an eye towards the future. You can see it in her face in all of these settings and I think that they are truly spectacular. I think Ernest Backrack really caught her for that time. 
Ernest Backrack at RKO Studios shot every major actress who performed there in the 30s, which would largely be Miss Hepburn as well as Betty Davis. Lot 218, we have three annotated Shakespeare books, Me Measure for Measure, Merchant of Venice, and The Taming of the Shrew. And these were books that Miss Hepburn carried with her to Australia in 1955 when she spent six months there performing for the Old Vic Company from London. It's well known, of course, Miss Hepburn being a great film actress, but it's not well known that she decided in 1950, at the age of 41, to take on Shakespeare and her first role was in New York for the play As You Like It. She got good reviews and decided to pursue that and it became a staple of her repertoire in the 50s was to at least once a year perform in a play whether it be in London, Stratford, Connecticut or in Australia for Shakespeare. What's amazing about these books, you of course have in Hollywood scripts, film scripts, and they're annotated. Well, these books were her scripts for acting in plays, and you'll see throughout them, not only has she signed them and put addresses of where she's staying, but she has made copious notes throughout as to how she should act or how she wants to change words. And again, for an actress, these are some of the most symbolic pieces you can have because it really, again, gives you an insight to what their creative process is. Next you'll see Lot 96, which are two purchase agreements for the rights to the film Philadelphia Story. And Every Katharine Hepburn fan has enjoyed the Philadelphia story. What they may not know is the story behind the Philadelphia story, which would be part of the Hepburn story. And that's at, at one of the lowest points, if not the lowest point, of Katharine Hepburn's career. She took her greatest risk. She was starring in Broadway in a play called The Lake, and she was getting her harshest reviews. Her last five films at RKO were not doing well. She had been labeled box office poison. She bought herself out. She went to, to the producer of The Lake and offered to buy herself out of her contract rather than go on in a flop. He asked her how much was in her bank account. She told him. She wrote a check for it and gave it to him. She had no money. She had few prospects. She was offered a movie called Mother Carrie's Chickens, which she turned down. And then lo and behold, she got a phone call from a playwright called Philip Barry, who had written a play for her called Holiday and had come up with another one called The Philadelphia Story. Instead of simply taking it to MGM and offering it to him and giving herself the lead role, she took it one step further which was amazing, not just for a woman, but for any actor to do this in the 30s, which were days of the studio system and seven-year contracts, which bound you to a studio. She went to her beau, who at that time was Howard Hughes, billionaire aviator, and he agreed to lend her the money to buy the film rights to the Philadelphia story. And without telling the head of MGM, Louis Mayer, who owned them, she negotiated those rights, resold them to MGM, and ended up jump-starting her career. When you're looking at documents that relate to entertainers, baseball players, celebrities, you always want to look at documents that are at the pivotal junctions of their careers. Again, we spoke about the Bill of Divorcement first contract. Very important because it is the start, it's the beginning. Here again, we're taking someone who's at the nadir of their career, and this is the pivotal document that sets her on a course that lasted her another six decades of stardom. The collectors are going to look at that and show that to be the pivotal moment in her career, and they're going to bid accordingly.
Next you'll see lots 16A and 169. We've got two 8x10 photos, one of Katherine Hepburn as Rose Sayre and one of Humphrey Bogart as Charlie Allnut in The African Queen. The first photo you see is Hepburn in all her regalia as Rose Sayre, obviously just before they start going down the river. And it's simply signed Katherine Hepburn, which is fairly typical. What's not typical is that Miss Hepburn did not sign very much. Her autograph is very sought after because she simply did not sign. The other photograph, having Bogart as Charlie Allnut, is a little bit different because there's an inscription on it and it says, for Kate, who disapproves. And as you look at this photograph, it even takes on more meaning because, of course, Charlie Allnut in his character is opening up a crate of Gordon's gin. And during the course of the movie, Rose Sayre takes him and takes him out of the gin and, and basically into her arms by the end of the movie. But what was going on during the filming of that movie is that by day they were filming, but by night Humphrey Bogart and John Huston were, were living it up. They were drinking buddies. Whereas Miss Hepburn was doing her best to keep herself in what she considered, considered to be great shape. The irony of all this is that Humphrey Bogart and John Huston went through the entire shoot in tip-top health, whereas Miss Hepburn drank the water, got sick, and lost 20 pounds, and was but a shadow of herself by, by the end of the shoot. So I just love the inscription for Kate who disapproves, because it means so much on every level from Humphrey. Lot 254, we have two, and as you can see, extremely well used Smithson address books from Miss Hepburn. She carried these from the 1950s to the 1970s, and they're a veritable who's who of Hollywood and theater. You have one of the other first couples of, of film and theater, Vivian Lee and Laurence Olivier, as well as several addresses for Spencer Tracy, not to mention George Cooker and Frank Sinatra. Anyone that you want to know who was big in the 1950s or 60s is sitting in Miss Hepburn's address book. Collectors love items like address books because they provide a window into that person's life. They can see who they were visiting or knew in any specific period of time. Did she know Laurence Olivier? Well, here he is, under O's. Did she know Vivian Lee? Well, here she is. Who was, did she associate with? Where did she go? Opening an address book is opening really a page of their life, and that means it was very, something very close and important to them, which therefore translates to collectors. Plot 690, which is the original manuscript and handwritten notes for Miss Hepburn's autobiography, Me, is one of the most important lots in the sale. And it comes up in our last session, and I believe it's going to end up being probably, if not the greatest highlight, one of. And the reason being is that, first of all, it was a New York Times bestseller in 1991. Now mind you, that's 10 years after she had won her fourth and last Best Actress Oscar. And I think it shows people that she was still as relevant in 1991 as she was in the 80s, the 70s, the 60s, the 50s, the 40s, the 30s. And it shows what an icon that she remained and, and a figure to people worldwide. That said, if you look at the handwritten material behind that, what collectors and fans are going to find interesting is the creative process. What did she cross out? What did she leave in? What was she thinking? And you see that, and you see that in stages. You're only seeing a small part of the entire manuscript, but we have over 4,000 pages. And it shows the entire progression from the first handwritten drafts, which are done in longhand on legal paper, all the way through the typewritten versions with annotations. And again, people will be able to see what she was thinking and how she was thinking and how she changed in her writing. Next, 
When you think Hepburn, you think Tracy, one of the most famous love stories in American cinema history. Their affair was basically an open secret in, in Hollywood. It was not well known until after he passed away. The American Film Institute called Katherine Hepburn the greatest female screen legend of all time. Nominated for 12 Oscars and winner of four, she played a lifetime of memorable roles. But it was her spirit and strength of character off screen that made her so unforgettable. What we hope to show is how truly she loved being Katherine Hepburn, how truly comfortable she was in her own skin, how much she lived life every day and took as much as she could out of it and put as much as she could into it. Today, On the Block takes you to Sotheby's New York for an intimate look at the property offered in their June 2004 estate sale of this truly iconic lady. When people think of Katherine Hepburn, they immediately think of Spencer Tracy. And that only makes sense. First, they had this fabulous love affair. She openly called him the love of her life. And they made nine films together. And still, even 37 years after they made their last film together, any time you hear of a, of a film, particularly a comedy, that stars a man and a woman, and there's some sort of battle of the sexes going on, they're inevitably compared to Hepburn and Tracy. However, Miss Hepburn had other men in her life prior to Spencer Tracy. Her first, of course, her husband, Ludlow Ogden Smith. But after she divorced him, she had a two-year love affair with Agent Leland Hayward. She wouldn't marry him. He ended up marrying another actress, Margaret Sullivan, she instead was wooed by Howard Hughes and had a two-year courtship with him. It was after that courtship that she met Spencer Tracy on the set of Woman of the Year in 1941. And when she met him, that was it. She was smitten, he was smitten, and they were together for the next 27 years until his passing in 1967. After that, I know of no other love affairs I think she has been quoted as saying that after Spencer Tracy, where else could she go? That, that he had been the love of her life and that was enough for her. And now we're going to take a look at some of the mementos that Miss Hepburn kept from some of her greatest love affairs. Our first lot is lot 55 and we have 24 telegrams that were written between Howard Hughes and Katherine Hepburn between 1937 and 1939. We don't think of the 1930s as an era where you might have a media frenzy like today with J-Lo and Ben Affleck and Brad and Jennifer and Brittany but back in the 30s the media was just as hungry for this type of star power. Howard Hughes landed his plane on the Bel Air Country Club golf course just so he could meet Katherine Hepburn. Evidently she had to have been impressed on some level because they started this courtship. In 1937 she was on the road performing Jane Eyre in Chicago and the first telegram that we have is from Howard Hughes on January 19, 1937 and it talks about how he's taking a train to that great Midwestern metropolis, Chicago and he's going to meet up with her that night after her performance and he hopes that she can stay up. What he doesn't mention in this telegram is that on that particular day he had broken his own transcontinental airspeed record. He was one of the greatest aviators in the world at that time and that day he had lowered his own record by two and a half hours and almost died in the process when his oxygen was cut off for 10 minutes. He managed to regain consciousness, take control of the airplane, and fly it to safety. 
But none of this is mentioned in that telegram. It's pretty much the equivalent of, hey, honey, I'll be home tonight. And when he got to the Ambassador Hotel that weekend, it caused a major frenzy. There were newsmen camped out at every entrance. They had to make a statement that weekend saying, no, they were not going to get married, that he was only there to see her perform in Jane Eyre. But it gives you a kind of feeling of the scope of, of the media frenzy behind their love affair at that time and how much attention they caused between this, their collective star power. And these telegrams, all of these telegrams give you this fabulous insight into the huge affection and the playfulness and the whimsy they have between one another because all of these telegrams are signed with nicknames. They never sign Howard or Kate. They're always signing Dynamite Dan, Old Boss, Old Conch Shell. And unfortunately, we don't know what what we don't know what the secrets are behind those nicknames but it's so great to see and we were a, actually a, we had to crack a code to figure out who exactly had sent these telegrams because most of them are addressed to Miss Emily Perkins well Emily Perkins was Miss Hepburn's assistant so Miss Hepburn always had her telegrams sent to a pseudonym when she was in a hotel so again it kind of gives you this sort of bird's eye view into what was going on into the relationship One of the most exciting lots in the sale is lot 56, and it is the only piece of jewelry in the sale. It is a sapphire and diamond brooch, as you can see in the shape of a basket of flowers, given to Katherine Hepburn by Howard Hughes. And this was during their courtship, and he probably gave it to her in sometime in 1938. And this was unusual, not for him. He loved to give expensive jewelry, but she didn't wear expensive jewelry. And you'll see, particularly as she gets older, you'll see her with less and less jewelry. However, we do have photos of her wearing this particular piece. And he bought it from one of his favorite jewelers in this Art Deco style. Our estimate in the sale is fifteen to twenty thousand dollars, but it is probably the one piece in the sale thus far that has received the most attention. And it will be very interesting to see where it ends up. Lot 459 are two portraits of Spencer Tracy done by legendary photographer Irving Penn. And I find them very interesting because if you look at them, it almost looks like he's cornered. And maybe that's some sort of metaphor to what his life was. Because when he met Katherine Hepburn on the set of Woman of the Year in 1941, he was married and he had two children. And even though he continued this love affair with Miss Hepburn for 27 years, he still maintained his marriage to his wife and his two children. And in fact, he would go home every Sunday and visit with them, even though most of the time he was living with Miss Hepburn. And I'm sure that that constituted in his mind quite a, a quandary at different times, having to lead two different lives on two different levels. Miss Hepburn's been widely quoted that after she divorced her husband, Luddy Smith, that she never wanted to get married again. And it's obvious, being in a relationship for 27 years, that, married, that being married or not married was never an issue for Miss Hepburn. And remember, too, at the time, their affair was basically an open secret in, in Hollywood was not well known until after he passed away. <music> Lot 448 is our carved swan, although Miss Hepburn called it her goose. And this is a piece she actually bought for her and Spencer Tracy while they were living on George Cooker's guest cottage on his property in Beverly Hills. 
it hung in that home. And then after Spencer Tracy passed away and she spent more time in her New York townhouse in Turtle Bay, the goose slash swan came with her and resided with her and is always a big part of her life. Collectors will love a piece like this because it's one of the, the symbolic pieces of the Tracy Hepburn relationship. Miss Hepburn loved art all her life. When she traveled, she toured museums. She bought some fabulous pieces of artwork, generally pieces that spoke to her, street scenes, seascapes. But what's not well known about Miss Hepburn was that she was also an accomplished artist herself. And that is an extremely personal side of her. So personal that the year after her autobiography, Me, made the New York Times bestseller list, she was approached to do a book on her art. She went so far to have her niece and nephew photograph her collection and interview her about it. But she decided that it was so personal in nature that she could not go through with the book. And I think that shows something about Miss Hepburn's inner spirit. Here is a woman who was in the business of creating all her life as an actress. But that was a business, even though it was a craft and an art. Whereas her painting and sculpting was simply a part of her. It was never for commerce. It was simply to explore a different part of her soul. Lot 464 should be immediately noticeable for many people. This is an Al Hirschfeld done of Spencer and Kate. Al Hirschfeld, not only one of our greatest caricaturists, but Tracy and Hepburn, one of his favorite subjects. And throughout the sale, we have a number of pieces by him. And he was a good friend of Miss Hepburn's. And it's obvious when you're looking at this that he did this with an enormous amount of an affection for both of them. For anyone who's seen a Tracy Hepburn movie, this piece sums up their sort of continual tongue-in-cheek battle of the sexes relationship between them, which is obviously has the underpinnings of, of a lot of playfulness and a huge amount of affection. Lot 279 is uh, one of our Toulouse Lautrec prints that was collected by Miss Hepburn, Mae Belfort. And again, this is very much like the Hirschfeld. You have collectability on two different levels. First, you have Toulouse Lautrec, one of the greatest artists ever. Secondarily, you have something that was from Miss Hepburn's collection. My suspicion is that she probably bought it when she was in Paris, as she did often in her travels. She purchased pieces and brought them back. And I think it probably appealed to Miss Hepburn because you see a woman who looks very independent and has a lot of spirit. And I think that relates back to Miss Hepburn directly. We have a number of iconic images of Catherine Hepburn in the sale, but lot 567 is one of my favorite images of her. This is a painting that was done in the early 70s by an artist named Mafani Pavlik. And what happened was, Miss Hepburn was doing an interview with Dick Cavett, and Pavlik saw her and decided to do a painting based on that tape, and then sent it to her. And this is the painting, and this hung in Miss Hepburn's home. This is one of her favorite representations of herself. And I think it captures her perfectly. Focused, talking, animated, lively, and brings out still the fabulous beauty that she still had at that time. What was captured here in this painting is, is that liveliness in her, that always that inner thinking, that inner concentration, which I think just comes out in her as a glow. Lot 
387 is one of the great representational pieces of Miss Hepburn's art. She loved to paint beach scenes, and she did it quite often, whether it was in Stratford, Connecticut, when she was performing Shakespeare, or in Australia on the beach of Sydney, or here, which is the Isle of Man, when she was visiting Guess Who's Coming to Dinner playwright Willie Rose. The reason why it particularly speaks to me is in many of her beach scenes, their water, their beach, there could be lighthouses quite often. She was quite fond of lighthouses. But this one's a self-portrait, which you don't often see. And the key to that is two things. One, she loved to put red. Red and white were her favorite colors. And you see her under the umbrella in a red bathing suit. The second clue, which is the more obvious clue, is that on the bag there is a giant K, K for Catherine. So it's a wonderful moment in her life and a wonderful painting and a great representation of her. Lot 460, the bronze bust of Spencer Tracy is probably one of the most endearing objects in the sale. One major reason is that Miss Hepburn called it her most prized possession. Secondarily, for someone who didn't have any lessons, it's an amazing recreation, an amazing representation of Spencer Tracy. It looks just like him. And it was obviously made with an enormous amount of love and affection. She did this in the 1960s. There was a period of time where she semi-retired. She lived in LA with, with Tracy and she took care of him. And that's really the time where she took her art the most seriously, where she painted still lifes of flowers and fruit and she sculpted. And there are two major sculptures in the sale. One we call Angel on a Wave, which she did, which is a, a bronze angel baby with wings on a glass slide and the other is this bust of Spencer. This bust sits on Spencer Tracy's desk in Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. And after Spencer Tracy passed away, it traveled with Miss Hepburn wherever she went, on the road or at her bedside in Fenwick. This particular bust, because of the relationship between Tracy and Hepburn, because of Miss Hepburn's open affection for this particular piece, and because of its intrinsic artistic value, is one of the top five pieces in the sale in interest. Coming up, Katherine Hepburn turns heads and raises eyebrows, creating a style that's all her own. She wore pants when women weren't considered to wear pants. She felt comfortable wearing khakis and a shirt at a time where women would change their outfits every day. Since the very beginning of her career, Miss Hepburn has been revered and noted for her style. And yet, to me, her style has always been about her substance because her style is whatever she wanted at any given time. She set trends, she never followed them. She wore pants when women weren't considered to wear pants. She felt comfortable wearing khakis and a shirt at a time where women would change their, their style and their outfits every day. Katherine Hepburn's style is all about being Katherine Hepburn. Lot 663, you can see we have a group of hats here. Miss Hepburn wore hats, A, because she loved them, but B, you have to remember, it's not well known, but she was very freckled and very fair from head to toe. She needed hats to protect her from the sun, and she was an outdoors woman and spent enormous amounts of time out in the sun, whether she was swimming or gardening or sketching by the beach or playing golf or tennis. So these hats were very much part of her daily outdoor existence. Lot 101, the navy blue Valentina cape, is very indicative of Miss Hepburn's early style from the late 1930s. 
At that time, she was still in the glamour phase of her career. And Valentina, who was a, a Russian immigrant and great designer, designed a number of pieces for her in the late 30s, including part of her wardrobe for Philadelphia Story. This particular blue navy silk cape is so much of Miss Hepburn's style at that time. You can see her throwing this over, a dress, some sort of wrap to go out for the evening. And this particular cape is as relevant today as it was 70 years ago. I can fully see some collector coming in and buying this and not putting it on a shelf or in a closet, but wearing it out the next night. Next up, we have lot 428, a pair of khaki pants, and 553, a Burberry vest. These are from Miss Hepburn's later period. She probably wore these in the 1960s, when khaki pants were her trademark. She loved Burberry vests. She traveled to London often, and in fact, there are three of them in the sale. And oftentimes, Miss Hepburn would wear personal items in her movies. You can see the Burberry vest in photos of her on vacation, and you can also see her in a Burberry vest in Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Miss Hepburn's decorating style was simply souvenirs of her life. When she traveled, she bought pieces that she loved, pieces that would remind her of great film trips, great moments in her life. She had no decorator. Her decorator was her life. And the items gave her a sense of magic and history. And she gave her items her own sense of aesthetic and magic because she loved having her objects around her. Every piece she had with her meant something to her. And therefore, she in her setting with her objects really became one. They were almost as if they set a consistent scene to her playing out her own life story. Lot 172 and 173, which is an African Sanufo chair and drum, were two of the pieces that Miss Hepburn brought back with her when she did her 1951 shoot, The African Queen in the Congo. And of course, she had to bring a memento back with her, and she often sat in the Sanufo chair in her living room at Fenwick. I don't know if she played the drum. Miss Hepburn is such a recognized traveler of the world that I think it's only natural to expect her to have something that's completely exotic in her surroundings. What more natural for Miss Hepburn to sit down in a Sanufo chair? It's almost as if you'd expect her to have a tree house in her backyard. Lot 256 is a Victorian high chair, which is also called the Gawky chair. And we don't know a whole lot about the history of where Miss Hepburn acquired it, but we do know how much it meant to her because she painted it several times. And in fact, one of the best paintings she ever did, which is now in a private collection because it was a gift that she, she gave to one of her close friends, was actually the cover of McCall's back in the 50s on an article that was done, and it's the only article I know of that was done about Miss Hepburn and her artwork. And you see this particular chair done in three different paintings, as I mentioned, the one on the cover of McCall's, one that Miss Hepburn painted of her close friend and assistant for 50 years, Phyllis Wilborn, and another painting she did of her own bedroom in California. This chair traveled with Miss Hepburn. It was with her in California, it was with her in New York, it was with her in Fenwick. So obviously it was a very beloved item. Lot 634, the American Oak and Brass Plant Stand, 
is one of my favorite pieces because whoever did this had a great sense of style because here it is a plant stand and it almost looks like it's opening up into a petal. And I'll bet you anything that's what appealed to Miss Hepburn because she bought this back in 1974 with her good friend and ABC correspondent, Cynthia McFadden, on a trip to New Salem, New York. Uh, it appealed to her. She, Miss Hepburn is known for always having loved nature and flowers. She adored flowers, particularly Queen Anne's lace and, uh, and certain types of lilies, and uh, brought that plant stand back, and that was with her in Fenwick. I find it amazing in this day and age that there's so many people, especially women, who identify with Katherine Hepburn. And I find it most amazing because here's a woman that passed away last year at 96 years old who started her career in the 1930s and continued her career through seven decades. This is why, one of the reasons why she's relevant. Most actresses last as long as their looks last. Whereas Miss Hepburn, in the 1930s, was glamorous, but at the same time, negotiated her own contracts. In the 40s and 50s, where most actresses would have retired or started raising families, she took on Shakespeare. And at a time where most actresses would have been resting comfortably at home in their 70s and 80s, she wins her last two Oscars. She had a long and varied career. She had a range where she could play anywhere from screwball comedy to huge high costume drama and excelled at all of it. What I hope people come away with is a sense of Miss Hepburn as a person as well as an actress. Miss Hepburn seems to need no introduction. People know the basic facts of Miss Hepburn's life and her career. But what we hope to show is how truly she loved being Katherine Hepburn, how truly comfortable she was in her own skin, how much she lived life every day and took as much as she could out of it and put as much as she could into it. And you see this in her hobbies. She was not an idle person. She painted, she sculpted, she traveled. She ate, she lived and loved heartily. And we hope people will be able to draw that, that sense and grace and independent spirit and love of life out of the exhibition.